thanks a lot dn and uh, thanks a lot all the participants to join in for this session uh, this is a very specialized subject uh, and a very focused one uh, particularly on the cross border insolvency uh, today we are going to uh, even more have a laser sharp focus on cross border insolvency particularly from a corporate perspective uh, we may touch a little bit on personal insolvency aspects uh, but we'll focus more on the corporate uh, uh, insolvency and bankruptcy uh, issues, particularly on the cross-border space. And uh, I'm very, very happy to have uh, uh, Mr. Ashok Kumar with us uh, to join in and give his uh, perspective on the international aspects of this subject, uh, and which uh, we know personally that he is very, very well versed with. He is a very successful and most sought after uh, lawyer when it comes to distressed, uh, you know, structuring or any acquisitions or even bankruptcy in relation to, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to Singapore and other jurisdictions. So uh, welcome uh, Ashok on this panel and we'll be happy, uh, you know, to have your views and understand how this uh, bankruptcy and insolvency perspective are held in light of the decision. Uh, so the topic we thought okay. was obviously relevant. Uh, one, because uh, when we had our insolvency and bankruptcy code formulated uh, in the late 2016, early 2017, uh, this aspect of insolvency and bankruptcy code was not made part of the main provisions. Uh, but in the process, we all know uh, India and the world, uh, there is so much of globalization, cross-border trade, uh, and you know uh, there are assets uh, of all the corporate debtors uh, across several jurisdictions, which make insolvency restructuring even more uh, intricate. Uh, and sometimes a uh, lot of questions arise as to what will happen uh, if there are parallel proceedings in two different jurisdictions or there are assets in different jurisdictions with different claims uh, from different creditors and how to you know, uh, bring all of that together or harmonize them. Uh, so with that, uh, we also saw, uh, which we will discuss uh, during the course of uh, today's session, the examples on Jet Airways and Videocon in India, which faced some of these issues. And then India responded to it uh, very swiftly. We already have a draft uh, legislation uh, to deal some of this aspect based on the unicentral model on cross-border insolvency. Uh, but uh, there is always more to learn and make sure we don't make uh, you know, similar mistakes or at least uh, make sure that we adopt some of the best practices in an Indian context. Uh, we thought this session would be very, very helpful. So with that uh, introduction uh, and the background to the topic, uh, let me straight away go to Ashok uh, with his more than 20 years of experience in corporate and insolvent proceedings. Uh, Ashok, what's your take on this uh, subject, particularly uh, when you practice uh, this in Singapore and other jurisdictions? Uh, what are the learnings? What are the do's and don'ts? Uh, what India should do? Uh, you know, you may be, uh, you know, learnings. So if you can give your opening remarks on that. Sure. I mean, uh, first of all, thanks for the very kind introduction. Um, and, and just for, for the people who are listening, um, <clears throat> um, our firm is actually a legal, a legal firm that, that, that only does special situations. So we do uh, we do um, uh, the the uh, corporate restructuring and insolvency in the stressed and distressed space. Now, um, so what I'm going to tell you about is just the Singapore experience. I wouldn't venture to suggest what India should do. India is a different country. It's got its own complexities and it's got its own systems. And at the core, the approach to restructuring in in, in India is also a bit different from the way it's moving. Singapore. So fundamentally, 
Singapore's regime and the changes that were brought in two years ago, um, the, the feel was that more debtor-led kind of process was more effective for restructuring. Okay, so we adopted many key features from the, the US Chapter 11 process, which is a debtor-driven process, as opposed to a creditor-driven process, which is what the UK has, which is essentially what you have and what Australia has, okay? Um, and, and that's in the common law world. So in the civil law world, of course, restructuring approaches are very different, okay? So the anti model law uh, adoption by Singapore that goes two years ago was first of all necessary because there was a global trend towards um, harmonizing insolvency laws and having cross cooperation um, uh, between jurisdictions. How it works fundamentally is that um, we have this whole concept of where is the, the, the main proceedings uh, in any restructuring, okay? Uh, that's determined by a whole host of factors, including the place of incorporation and, and, and where the center of main interest of the company is, where its operations are, where its management is, all these things. And then when, when, when that is determined, and that's where the restructuring is being run, then really it's about cross-border, where else should assist these proceedings, okay? That's at the heart of the model law, okay? How it's meant to work. It's, it's meant to have a universalist approach to restructuring where once it is decided where the main proceedings are and each country's own country, own laws will determine where the main proceedings are. That's the way it works. It's a strange concept, but so let's say, I'll give you an example. So let's say we have, um, an Indian company that wants to center its restructuring in Singapore, it can do that because it submits to the Singapore jurisdiction, right? But is it where the center of main interest is? It's just unknown. So let's say you want to go to the US and another group of creditors wants to say, hey, you know, it really shouldn't be Singapore, it should be India. So these are issues that come up and continue to come up time and time again. So choosing the right jurisdiction to center the restructuring is, is a big issue, okay? Um, now, because that leads into the whole question of where you forum shop, because if let's say I want to go to a, re, a, a jurisdiction where I have perhaps more control because of the way the jurisdiction is, that's forum shopping, okay? Forum shopping is, uh, is, 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 is always the center of a lot of disputes when you're looking at application of the downstream model law. There's good forum shopping as well. So what companies do is sometimes they go and move the entire operations just for the purposes of being able to drive a restructuring in that jurisdiction, okay? Um, and they're good places and they're bad places, right? So. So, so this, I think when you adopt the model law, you will see this issue and you will face this issue and it's going to be something you're going to have to grapple with uh, in a significant way. Um, but there's established case law in, 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 in the US and other jurisdictions and on, on what is good char foreign shopping, what bad foreign shopping is and how foreign jurisdictions assist and harmonize uh, to assist the whole restructuring. Okay, um, I think over the last two years since we started this, um, you know, the, the, just like chapter 11 when it started in the late 70s, uh, the, the, the law was, there was an established ecosystem already, okay? Uh, an ecosystem which was fundamentally led by creditor banks um, and the restructurings were all pretty much centered around their interests. Okay, not necessarily in the interest of restructuring the company to get it on its feet to save the jobs. And, you know, I mean, restructuring is meant to bring the company back to life. So it's, that's so that's a cultural issue. What is the culture? Is it going to be a rescue culture, which is where Singapore is going? And the US has been since the late 70s. Are you going to move into a culture where it's pretty much going to be in the hands of the bank? That's something you've got to decide. 
what's best for your country, you know, and what works for your country. Because sometimes what may work for us may not work for you. What may work for the US may not work for you. You've got to decide what is what is what what works for you. Okay. So I, I, I think uh, you know, there's, I can I can talk about all the issues, uh, but these I think these are the key issues that you're probably going to deal with currently. Your 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 IBC uh, is a creditor led process. Not only a creditor led process, it is a financial creditor led process. Okay, uh, that seems to have worked for you guys. Okay, it seems to have worked for you guys. Should that evolve into something more international? Something that is uh, going to bring in more capital into restructuring. And that's at the heart also of, of these provisions that were brought into Singapore. We've got rescue financing provisions that give you super priority financing and give the company additional working capital. Working capital is not going to come in if every time they, it comes in, it doesn't write the upside on value. Okay. New money has to write the upside on value. It must. It's, it's, it, otherwise, no one's going to put money in. That's new money into the system. That's a GDP contributor to your economy. And that's a very critical factor because, you know, how, how do you then attract foreign investment into distressed investments into your country? Is something that I think you guys really need to wrap your no, heads around. And if too much control is with the banks, you're going to have a problem with that. We are having a problem too, I can tell you. <laughs> That's true. No, we'll we'll discuss this. This is uh, pretty much uh, what we want to you know cover in, in a little more detail. So yeah. before I come back to you, Ashok, and get your sense on some very specific issues, let me yeah. first put the uh, things in perspective because why we are discussing today is we already have a proposed cross-border framework in India uh, vis-a-vis the insolvency and bankruptcy code. Uh, we obviously want to discuss whether this needs uh, certain changes, whether this requires any, uh, you know, uh, modifications. But before that, uh, Bauna, can you give uh, very briefly the salient features of what is already proposed in India, so that at least we all are on the same page when we discuss about uh, what other things that we need to do to make the system more robust? Sure, Vyapa, yeah, thanks. So, um, as you mentioned, the UNCITRAL model on cross-border insolvency is proposed to be adopted into the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code in India. So, this, if it does get adopted into the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, will be done on a reciprocal basis with other countries that have adopted the model law. So, basically, what the draft provisions for now provide is that there should be access of foreign representatives to the, uh, uh, you know, to the adjudicatory authority in India, which is the NCLT. So basically a foreign representative can approach the NCLT and try to get the foreign proceeding that's uh, taking place recognized. Now, these proceedings that happen uh, uh, outside of India can be classified into main proceedings or non same proceedings as uh, Mr. Kumar uh, informed us uh, earlier. So the main proceedings would entail where the uh, debtor has a center of main interests. So in India, they ha uh, the draft uh, provision suggests that this would be the registered office unless uh, there is something to show that it is not the center of main proceedings. Other foreign proceedings will be classified as a foreign non-main proceedings where there's an establishment of the debtor. Now, why is this classification relevant? Because the classification is what determines the extent of the relief that the NCLT can give to these foreign proceedings in India. So if it is a main proceeding, then the NCLT has to mandatorily impose a moratorium on uh, a number of things like legal proceedings against that corporate debtor in India, uh, on the corporate debtor transferring or trying to alienate its assets in India, and so on and so forth. If it's a non-main proceeding, then in that case, the NCLT has a discretion on a case-to-case -case basis, can decide uh, to what extent it wants to impose a moratorium on the corporate debtor's uh, actions and uh, assets in India. So uh, all in all, the draft provisions, again, what they try to do is they facilitate cross-border insolvency by providing access to foreign representatives to by recognizing foreign proceedings by providing relief or assistance in these foreign proceedings, 
and to facilitate you know the coordination and cooperation of different resolution professionals of courts and adjudicatory authorities across different jurisdictions sure so i think uh, that gives a good uh, background and i think this has come out uh, particularly in light of some of the experience india already had uh, in, in in this regard with regard to the cross border issues uh, and the first case uh, which comes out clearly is the jet airways uh, where uh, this issue was discussed and grappled with uh, so uh, before we you know deep dive into how some of those aspects particularly where uh, assets are in different jurisdictions or creditors are in different jurisdictions uh, while the main operations or the companies incorporated in india uh, how to you know harmonize some of these aspects so uh, before we go into that arjun do you want to give a little background on the jet airways case and what was the issue and also give a little bit of an idea as to what happened then and uh, what is likely to happen with the new uh, amendment which is already proposed in that same situation uh, thanks, Rapak. So, uh, to give you a quick background of where the Jet Airways case stands as of now and what are the cross border implications of the Jet Airways case, uh, Jet Airways is an Indian airline which was sent for corporate insolvency resolution process by its creditors in India. However, Jet Airways, being uh, a, a, a global airline, had a lot of assets in different jurisdictions. These assets are uh, spares, inventory, uh, aircrafts. And most importantly, airport slots in various international airports. So some of these assets were also situated in Netherlands, where one of the district courts in Netherlands had initiated bankruptcy proceedings in respect of an offshore regional office of Jet Airways, and also appointed an administrator or a trustee to oversee the affairs of this regional office and to safeguard the assets of Jet Airways in the territory of Netherlands. So this Dutch trustee had initially uh, filed an application in the Indian insolvency resolution process to be impleted in the process and to be given audience in the during the course of the process. The National Company Law Appellate Tribunal, after hearing the Dutch trustee as well as the Indian stakeholders, had taken a decision that currently the Indian Bankruptcy and Insolvency Court does not have a mechanism to effectively deal with the cross border implications of the jet case and therefore they would have to come up with an ad hoc mechanism this ad hoc mechanism actually got formulated as a joint operation between the dutch trustee and the indian resolution professional which got crystallized as a cross border insolvency protocol now the important part over here is that this protocol although put down the different mechanisms to increase the efficiency of access to information, cooperation and communication between the resolution professionals and the adjudicatory authorities, it did not provide any mechanism by which the proceeds arising out of a sale of assets, both in India and Netherlands, would be distributed amongst the creditors of both the jurisdictions in any particular mechanism. Now, uh, the, the, both the parties, the Dutch as well as the Indian parties had entered into a preliminary or a, or, or a conditional sale uh, of the Dutch assets to KLM, which is the flagship airline company of Netherlands. But that did not come through because the International Airport Authority of Netherlands did not allow the slot sale from JET to KLM. But from this entire point, what we actually would want to understand, and Ashok has a question to you, is that if uh, there is a conflict in the laws or the domestic laws of different jurisdictions on the priority of repayment to creditors or the preferential treatment of creditors, how would the proceeds of sale of assets be distributed amongst creditors of different jurisdictions in that case? Okay, so that's a complex question. But first of all, I, I need to ask Bhavana a question. Is there a public policy exception in your new law? for recognition of cross-border insolvency proceedings? Yes, there is. There is a public policy. <laughs> <clears throat> and Arjun, uh, the protocol was just caught to court communication in JET, am I correct? That's right. Okay, so two completely different concepts, okay? 
the the protocol that you are talking about, which 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 has um, I don't know whether they use the same protocol that 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 we are talking about, which is what they call the Gin protocol. Okay, uh, is a court to court cooperation protocol. You just it's it's you must see that only as a mechanism for courts to pick up the phone and to be able to talk to each other and set up a platform to be able to discuss things. Okay, right to harmonize things, not to to change to change anything. Ultimately, you need the brass tacks of the law to be able to do that. Okay. So now, when you do cross-border recognition of an insolvency proceeding, okay, one concept you must understand that at the first instance, like Bhavana was talking about, the first instance when you're when you're trying to put the plan through, you're seeking recognition of the foreign main proceedings, okay, for the purposes of the moratorium so that you can get the plan worked through okay that part is relatively straightforward once it is determined that that is a foreign main proceeding okay and if let's say it's a singapore restructuring and i'm asking india who has adopted the model law to recognize my proceeding all it's doing and you must remember this and they're not recognizing the foreign rep they're recognizing the proceedings and the fact that the foreign rep is the one who is administering the proceedings in, in, in that home jurisdiction, okay, right? So, now, once the plan is done, okay, then what happens is you need to get the plan recognized. That's stage two. Okay. So, Singapore has, we are doing the first one with an Indonesian company right now, okay? So far, it's all, all fundamentally been recognition of the, of the proceedings for the purposes of a moratorium, okay? Um, and in, those, in that particular case we're doing, there are some concepts which exist in India. Indonesia is a civil law country, okay? They have concepts which are very alien to us, like debt territoriality and, and, and priorities, which work very differently, consolidation of votes. It's three different, three, this company has three different branches, common shareholding, that's all. It's not, it's not, it's not part of a group in a traditional sense, but the vote is being taken as one together. But the distribution of proceeds is being done in each individual silo. And that was done fundamentally because we recognized that certain jurisdictions were critical to get this plan across the line, to get it recognized, okay? And if it, if it, if it is so repugnant to, to, to the local law, if let's say, for example, I want if, in this particular case, if the concept is so alien to Singapore law that Singapore law says, this is against my public policy, right? Because it's fundamentally off, right? There's a risk the Singapore court won't recognize the plan. Okay. So what you need to do, and it, this is this is this is quite important from an objective point of view of what the model law tries to achieve. What it tries to achieve is to force you to harmonize and universalize the restructuring in the jurisdictions where you want it to work. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So so you so to answer Arjun's question, you need to work it into the plan somehow to get it across the line. It cannot be so repugnant to the public policy in the place you want it recognized. This is quite critical. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So I think, uh, uh, Arjun, I had one question because uh, Ashok also touched upon the issue of moratorium, which we have seen uh, uh, being very alive when the Videocon case happened. So if you can give a little bit of a flavor to that case, uh, but more importantly, both for Jet Airways and Videocon, if you can give an idea as to pre cross border insolvency protocol or or the new framework which will come into place and uh, uh, post that coming into place how those things could have been better handled from an indian perspective and then of course we can move on to the other topics as well sure sure thanks Apik. so so in the video con case uh, we had a slightly different kind of a situation where 
where uh, multiple entities of the videocon group had the corporate insolvency resolution process initiated against it and thereafter the adjudicatory authority decided to consolidate all of these proceedings into an ad hoc group insolvency proceeding where 13 of these entities were going to do a, a common insolvency resolution process however uh, the the md of the videocon group venugopal dhut uh, as a shareholder and and uh, uh, of the of the entities had filed an application seeking to include the foreign oil and gas assets of the videocon group into the indian insolvency process and to extend the indian moratorium to the foreign companies the, the foreign step down subsidiaries of the indian companies as well as the assets controlled by those foreign subsidiaries and that was effectively being challenged by the indian creditors because the indian creditors effectively wanted to sell those foreign assets in separate unconnected proceedings and not club them with the indian insolvency resolution process in however the nclt at the end of it reached a conclusion that the foreign companies and the indian companies all formed one single economic entity and to better achieve the objective of the ibc which is maximization of assets of the uh, corporate debtor and to look after the uh, interest of all stakeholders it was necessary to include the foreign assets within the indian insolvency process and extend the moratorium to the foreign assets as well now uh, this was a unique situation where uh, the moratorium was actually being imposed on foreign assets and foreign companies without actually approaching the foreign court because for example if the proposed cross border framework is to come into play as of today then the indian resolution professional would have to compulsorily file an application with the relevant judicial authority in the foreign jurisdiction which would be brazil or indonesia and get the indian proceedings recognized and thereafter extend the moratorium but because there is no such process provided or available under law as of now to the indian insolvency resolution professional the nclt had to take this ad hoc measure of unilaterally extending the moratorium to the foreign assets as well i think this will possibly also answer one of the questions which has come up on the chat by ishan chopra uh, and uh, let us know if that doesn't answer your uh, question which basically says how will nclt decide the extent of partial moratorium on case to case basis uh, i think that's what possibly arjun was also explaining unless arjun you want to add anything on that point mm -hmm. so that we don't have to come back on moratorium again and ashok you wanted to say something on this if you want to add uh, please feel I've free a, i've got a point please feel there. free you see the, the 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 critical thing is this again the moratorium under the model law is almost automatic if it's established. If it, it, so the Indian court, let's say Singapore proceedings, we are seeking recognition in India, okay, right? And so the Indian courts, will, Indian courts will decide as a matter of Indian law, where is the foreign main? That is the way the model law works. Once they decide that it is the main proceedings and it's quite established, case law in the US about what is main proceedings and all that. At the heart of it is Comey, okay? The, the moratorium is almost automatic. It's almost automatic, okay? If the foreign main proceedings, okay? It, so if it's just foreign main proceedings, then the court has a ju jurisdiction to decide, a discretion to decide whether it wants to accept the moratorium or not. So it's actually, so, so the model law adoption may fundamentally change how the Indian courts, or let's say if the Indian court, if it's an Indian restructuring to, rec to be recognized in Singapore, there's not much leeway for a Singapore judge to say, I'm not going to recognize. Okay. If it is established that it's the foreign main. Okay. So, so, so you know, there's not much latitude. And, I, and partial moratorium is not even a concept in the model law. It, it is, it, 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 what what would happen in the recognition is that it will there are two parts first once you establish this foreign main then you come down to what kind of reliefs should be given for the moratorium okay to recognize those proceedings 
that's where you get into some nuances in terms of what works in the country and what doesn't in the foreign country. So oh. it, it's uh, it's that's how it's that's how it's meant to work. Okay. More, more, more or less, it gets mirrored. More or less, it gets mirrored. Understood. Yeah. Uh, Vyapak, are you still there? Okay, I think uh, we have lost Vyapak because of some connection problems, but we'll continue. So, uh, uh, Ashok, just carrying on with another case uh, over here in India, and from the case, I'll come on to a question directly for you. Uh, which is uh, the case of SCL manufacturing. In this case, what had happened is uh, SCL manufacturing was undergoing an insolvency resolution process in India, where the company and, and the company had challenged that resolution process by way of a writ petition in the High Court. During the pendency of that writ petition, uh, the company itself decided to file uh, an application under Chapter 15 of the US bankruptcy code in a Delaware court uh, seeking to extend the moratorium as applicable in India to its US assets by making the Indian proceedings be recognized as the foreign main proceedings. Yes. Now, the, now the question over here is that although the US Delaware court recognized the Indian proceeding as the foreign main proceeding and put a moratorium on the US assets of SEL manufacturing, but essentially what happened was that the, the Indian process continued and today we have actual resolutions being contemplated and negotiated between the committee of creditors in India with prospective acquirers. So yeah. if we have a situation where an acquirer is having a successful resolution plan being approved by the NCLT, how do you think this resolution applicant will get some kind of an immunity in respect of the foreign claims of creditors in US, uh, if if these claims were in respect of a Singapore creditor instead, yeah. So so th that's the second stage, right? So first stage, like I said, the moratorium is fairly easy because the chapter fifteen, the model law, depending on how you adopt the model law into your own country, it can be either reciprocal or that means I will only recognize you if, if you recognize me, okay? But the US is not like that. Singapore is not like that. Hong Kong is not like that. Sorry, uh, uh, the the UK is not like that. Neither is Australia. So, so the rec the chapter fifteen recognition is is not that's not no surprise because very little leeway for the Delaware judge to say, I will not recognize the proceedings and grant the moratorium. Okay. Now, so it's, it's stage two, right? The stage two where you are recognizing the plan. Okay. The reality is this. Once there is a once a plan is recognized, okay, and it will be recognized on the basis that I think very narrow objections, okay. Fundamentally, the Delaware Court will look at it and say, look, does this offend my 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 public policy? Okay. Uh, the latitude for them to say no, all right, uh, is again not too much. Because that is how the model law is supposed to work. So if, if you know what what could be crossing the line on public policy is 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 where where you you know where you you the, the what you're doing there is so fundamentally wrong in in the U.S. Okay, like you know ignoring the U.S. tax authorities, okay, and lumping them in and compromising them under the plan. Okay, it's that sort of thing where the recognition of the plan can meet some difficulty so it is actually still fairly narrow and us case law is very very robust on this you, you you will see you know plans in 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 latin america getting approved um, some of these companies also you know not necessarily uh, and that's the that's the controversy about the model law right because you know if you go and shop you go on foreign shop, shift your Komi to another country, okay, which is rescue friendly, and that becomes the foreign main. The model law actually gives you very little leeway in where, let's say in India, if your company in India wants to just shift this ops to another friendly jurisdiction, they can do that. And 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 is that is that is 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 it, how Indian courts are going to view that is 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 going to be interesting to see. 
you you may accidentally give the promoters a fair amount of power which they currently don't have. In your law now. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question here. Uh, well, this is a group group insolvency question. You. So, so the question uh, uh, is that if there are healthy as well as unhealthy entities, as in if there are stressed entities in one particular jurisdiction, uh, and there is an insolvency proceeding currently underway for that particular stressed asset, uh, if if we would want to extend a moratorium in respect of assets in another cross-border jurisdiction where that entity particularly is profitable, then how do you ensnare a profitable entity into uh, uh, the insolvency resolution of a otherwise stressed entity in a different jurisdiction. Okay, it's, it's, you know, these things are meant to work within the entity. So the group, insol group insolvency proceedings legislation, Anshitral has got his own law on that. It is not really fully universally accepted in yet. Okay, but currently, how it currently works, I don't know what you guys are planning because the last time I was in India, I know I was, there was some talk about about trying to to look at some new laws for group insolvency proceedings, okay? Uh, which is a creature, a separate kind of creature, but currently the moratoriums and all these things that we're talking about fit only within the company, okay? Um, there is latitude um, to extend only the moratoriums up and down, okay? All right, to assist in sort of group, group reorganization, but it is not, an ancestral sort of model law on group restructuring, which is a creature all on its own. I don't know what, what is India, is India putting in a group insolvency law into the new law? No, as of now, uh, the draft framework, which is there for deliberation, doesn't have any particular provision on group insolvency, but uh, that is something which is under under uh, process uh, for, for uh, discussions, and maybe we'll get some provisions uh, already inserted into the framework when it actually comes into force. Okay, what we have in Singapore is this. If company A applies for uh, protection, okay, uh, once it gets its protection, it can then ask for specific orders for a moratorium only, eh? just a moratorium, not necessarily for the plan to interfere with everything else, okay, but just for the moratorium, just hold the group, okay, shareholder level, I mean, up up and down, huh? the subsidiaries and, and parent, just hold the status quo while the restructuring for company A is being worked out. Okay. Wow. So, so, so that's all we have, okay? And that is not a group insolvency proceeding restructuring, uh, which is fundamentally how you take everything and put it all together into one master plan sort of broadly speaking, that's what it's supposed to achieve. That that law, we also don't have. Sure, sure. So I don't think to... even the US has taken it in yet, I, I could be wrong about that. Sure. So uh, just to also give you a, a perspective on the Indian position of, of public policy and how that will figure out as per the draft framework. So yes. uh, as per the ancestral model law, there is this word called manifestly, which comes before the word public policy in respect yeah. of, of what can or cannot be set aside by the adjudicatory authority of the uh, jurisdiction which has to enforce uh, a foreign or recognize a foreign uh, uh, proceeding. So what the Indian drafters have decided to do is to keep the word manifestly rather than exclude it like in Singapore. Singapore does not have the word manifestly. Yeah, so, we took it out. Yeah, so, yeah. so what India has done is India is in agreement with the idea of the ancestral model law that the the idea is to try and give recognition to as much of a foreign proceeding as possible rather than to narrow down and to give a wider discretion to the adjudicatory authority to reject the uh, the foreign proceeding and that's why they have kept or retained the word manifestly but over here, there is something that we can still keep in mind specifically from the peculiarity of the Indian scenario that when a, an adjudicatory authority has the discretion and the power to decide which particular foreign main proceeding or non main proceeding to entertain and introduce into the Indian system or not, basis a wide term like public policy, there is uh, there is uh, a lot of difference of opinion arising from 
various benches and to have some kind of a harmonious understanding of this phrase it yeah. might be preferable to have some kind of a guidance for what may or may not constitute public policy and what yeah. would be the scope of this discretion for the adjudicatory authority to to specifically reject the and the, the introduction of a foreign main proceeding inside the country i had to argue this recently in singapore okay all right for that same indonesian case i was telling you about because we took away we took away um, the word manifestly so does this mean that the singapore courts have more leeway uh, when it comes to assessment of public policy to not recognize okay the indonesian pkpu in that case and and what we did was we 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 said the threshold is not very different because we relied on the international arbitration type cases where you look at public policy considerations in setting aside an arbitral award and it's very high okay and we said singapore public policy which is relevant here and here and in your case it'll be indian public policy that matters okay Singapore public policy is the, the, the word manifest doesn't doesn't really loosen it so much because it's still a fairly high threshold but i agree with you it was an issue some clarity on this if you so you're going to keep manifest right okay and the u.s case law body of case law is extremely clear on this it's a very high threshold very very high Understood. yeah even if even even in cases um, there are some uh, u.s cases where there were Mexican proceedings that were the foreign main, okay, Mexican and Brazilian, two different cases. And the objecting creditors uh, fought a chapter 15 recognition in the US on the basis that, you know, this is the kind of jurisdiction it's coming from and all these things. The court said, look, you know, it has, to, it's a very high threshold, no go. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So they recognized. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, switching a little bit on a subject which uh, also affects uh, the local proceedings, uh, which may not be in the insolvency court, uh, but let's say there are cross-border uh, insolvency proceedings going on in different jurisdictions, and there are existing proceedings in arbitrations or other court proceedings going on in India. Uh, Bauna, what is your view uh, pre and post the proposed framework? as to how would one deal with those proceedings, because there at least you cannot harmonize in that sense. So will moratorium apply immediately? Will there be a need for a specific provision and whether current framework uh, provides for that? Thanks, Kappa. So the current framework doesn't uh, provide for it, considering that we don't have uh, a, any cross-border insolvency framework that is operational right now. But the draft provisions do attempt to address it. So, uh, as I explained before, the NCLT can either recognize a proceeding as a foreign main proceeding or a non main proceeding. In case the foreign proceeding has been recognized as a main proceeding, then all of uh, uh, the litigation arbitration proceedings against the corporate debtor in India would be frozen. That is, it would go under moratorium. This would include its initiation against the corporate debtor as well as the continuation of any arbitration or legal proceedings against that corporate debtor. If it's a non-main proceeding, then it, the NCLT can choose to uh, uh, impose a moratorium if it thinks that uh, it is necessary in that particular case. Understood. Got it. So that at least that at least will make a lot of things clear because people are usually in in a flux when they don't know. Uh, what would be the effect on these proceedings? Because you can still harmonize insolvency process, which is still doing the same thing. The objective is the same. Here, the objectives may be different, and therefore, implications of moratorium may have a very different effect. Yeah. But uh, uh, Ashok, I think no discussions can end these days without COVID nineteen reference. <laughs> and we'll, we will. We will we will definitely do that as well in this uh, session. But before that, I just had one last question about uh, the role of judicial insolvency network in Singapore. Yes. Uh, is that something which is uh, good to emulate? Is this something which helps? Uh, and how does it 
uh, play a vital role in the whole cross border scenario? I think it's, I think it's very important. It's not used enough. Okay. Um, the um, and I'm not saying that because it was started. It was started by our jurisdiction, but but I think court to court communication, which happens, you know, the US side particularly, court to court communication there within the US, and you know, US is a huge country, and also in Lat M, right, uh, and the UK. Even before this Gin protocol, there was a, there were there was a lot of court to court communication how to manage the whole restructuring. It is absolutely critical, okay, um, and and I think it is it is something that one should have because sometimes, you know, you want to be able to pick up the phone and just understand why certain judge has done something so that you can you know decide in your own jurisdiction what is the right thing to do, okay? Sure. Um, and it's particularly so if you're dealing with a with a civil law jurisdiction, because like I said, a lot of the concepts are very alien to what we know. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's 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 a complete. You know, you don't even have judicial precedent concepts. You know, you don't have, you don't have even like I said, the debt debt, debt is seen very differently in a in a in a civil law jurisdiction. There's a whole concept of territoriality of debt, where the debt is cited, is absolutely paramount. So, you know, to, us, to us, common law lawyers, when we, when we, when it doesn't we, matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. That's true. That's yeah. true. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, coming to the favorite topic of COVID 19, maybe Arjun, uh, before we hear from some great measures that Singapore has already taken in a consolidated uh, action, uh, bringing in the Emergency Measures Act uh, or the Temporary Measures Act, as they say. Uh, but uh, what India has done uh, in, in reference to COVID-19 and some of these provisions, if you can quickly give uh, an update, uh, including what came out over the weekend uh, as part of uh, the whole, uh, you know, finance minister's speech. So if you can give a little idea and then maybe we'll go to Ashok to understand uh, what India can still do and learn uh, from Singapore, though, as Ashok said, it's a different jurisdiction, but definitely there is something which we can always, uh, you know, uh, take as a as a base and then amend it to the needs of India. Thank you. Thanks, Rapa. So, so the measures which have been coming in from India have actually come in from various regulatory authorities from the central government, and they have all been staggered with the evolution of the actual ground level scenario. So for one, the the uh, the uh, threshold to file uh, to have the ability to file an application under the insolvency code was increased from one lakh to one crore, which was to give relief and respite to smaller MSMEs and other entities which are not being able to otherwise uh, repay their debts. And small defaults would also have given the ability to creditors to initiate the process. Uh, secondly, the RBI. Uh, also gave uh, lenders the ability to provide a moratorium to their borrowers and any default for a period of three months would not result in an automatic downgrade of their accounts from standard to uh, non-performing. And, and uh, there have been many other practical uh, regulatory changes as well. For example, the time period of the lockdown has been specifically removed from the timeline for completion of uh, resolution and liquidation processes. Uh, the the requirement to file applications, petitions, and appeals before the NCLT and NCLAT have been given uh, an extension from the limitation perspective. And like you said, the finance minister has recently referred to certain changes, the actual language and text of those changes. We will have more clarity on by way of an ordinance, which will most probably come uh, in the public domain very shortly. But essentially what we are looking at is uh, is a, a suspension on fresh proceedings for a period of six months which might get extended by another six months or maybe directly for 12 months and also any default in respect of a coronavirus related debt will not be considered to be a default under the ibc obviously these limited statements give more questions than answers in the mind of creditors and borrowers uh, with respect to you know whether it will be only the adjudication of claims 
or whether it will be even filings which will be suspended what will happen with respect to limitations for defaults which have happened prior to the lockdown what is a coronavirus related debt uh, whether that will essentially include only debts which uh, or defaults which have occurred during the lockdown or any default which has occurred due to an impact of the lockdown so these things will get more clarity once the ordinance and the text is out sure. so uh, ashok we know we, we have studied a little bit on the Tem temporary measures act which singapore came up and which has some consolidated view taken in terms of uh, the insolvency and bank corruptcy provisions in in singapore uh, can you give us a you know uh, some idea about what that is uh, sure. and uh, whether that's the right way and you know what more we can do uh, to ensure that you know uh, the the things that needs to be addressed post covid are at least immediately addressed and then of course we can look at future as we as we go along sure okay first of all i must say that we're having some problems containing this virus but um some oversight in some places so it's, it's going to be a, a long haul okay i think just from a macro perspective all the countries of the world that have introduced legislation have adopted the same concept that like india has which is to suspend rather than 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 you know change obligations okay um and 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 that's at the core of of what we have done as well so so first if you look at it the law the, the legal support and with the with this temporary law is meant to 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 work hand in glove with the commercial support and the dollars that the company the government has given okay so what to understand the legal support and how the legislation works you need to understand what the commercial support is so the commercial support fundamentally sits into three baskets okay one is subsidies on 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 subsidiaries uh, subsidies um, uh, to to keep jobs that's the a big driver okay subsidies to companies just to keep jobs um, and then another thing is really in relation to commercial leases right they gave a whole series of rebates because it's a big part of cost and they gave a whole series of rebates to landlords and that was meant to be passed down to tenants okay to help uh, with, 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 with the situation. And then uh, another big bucket of the commercial support was access to working capital, okay? Here, it, it's, it's in two parts. One, they give unsecured loans uh, to up to $1 million uh, uh, for working capital needs. And for that kind of small loan, the government takes a big sharing of risk on the repayment of the loan. It's just to keep the liquidity going, okay? Then, for bigger loans, uh, they give uh, bridging support, okay? Uh, a bridging loan support, and that can be quite substantial. <clears throat> now, if we take that into account, the legal, the legal framework to assist and support and complement the commercial support focuses at its heart several concepts. One is suspension, I told you, okay, which is the same thing as a member. Second thing is, it is applies to certain types of contracts which have, which are most impacted by the COVID crisis, okay, what they call scheduled contracts. And they are mainly, um, uh, you know, um, leases, um, loan facilities for SMEs, okay, uh, performance bonds in the construction space, uh, high high purchase and conditional contracts, event contracts, tourism contracts, construction contracts, and leases and licenses for non-residential immovable property. Okay, so it's very contract driven. The kind of contracts that that are impacted most by this crisis. That's that's the driver. Okay, uh, the the suspension, and then on top of that, it has to be COVID related. So it 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 only suspends obligations which are meant to be performed after the 1st of February, okay? Um, and for contracts entered into before the 25th of March. And it only goes on, this suspension goes on from 20th April to 19th of October, okay? So that's essentially how the legal framework works. When, when everybody is asking this question, 
look guys you know all this suspension and everything what's going to happen and when the bill comes due because it's not dealing with the obligation just kicking it down the road right okay so you know the third quarter of the year is going to be carnage we all expect it because that's when the pieces will be on the floor and then one's got to decide what stays on the floor then what's got to be one's got to then decide those that can be picked up from the floor should you even pick them up because is the business going to be relevant in the post-covid world because things are going to change okay and then what must surely be safe so the bankers will have to re reevaluate where they want to be what they want to support uh, new money will go to where the businesses are going to stay relevant uh, and and uh, so you know nobody can can guess where that's going to end up okay and, and you know i think for a country like singapore you know our economy is so externally driven you guys have a real domestic economy right um so it's a tough times for singapore i tell you ahead really tough times understood so uh uh, Arjun, any last thoughts based on what uh, Ashok talked about in terms of the international experience as to what India should or should not do as part of the proposed framework? And uh, then maybe one last uh, word from Ashok and we close the session at four. Sure. So, so uh, I guess uh, we can learn from other, uh, other uh, areas of uh, um, uh, law as well to further strengthen the cross-border framework. For example, uh, in, in, in the context of Arbitration Act and arbitration proceedings, what we have understood is that uh, whatever has been pronounced by courts through jurisprudence has found its way into the statute to provide further guidance to adjudicatory authorities in how to decide matters uh, with more certainty and using less discretion. So I think what we can do is uh, there are there's a lot of mature jurisprudence in various jurisdictions uh, like Singapore and US where courts have over the course of time crystallized many different ingredients to entertain and induct and admit various kinds of proceedings. Maybe some of those can be further uh, uh, crystallized and introduced as, as specific provisions to guide our NCLTs better rather than to give them a wide playing field to use their discretion. Sure. Thanks a lot. Uh, any last point, Ashok, from your side? Uh... I think I think uh, really, Arjun, you, you hit the nail on the head. Really, it's about it's about making sure that people don't lose sight of what concept behind the model law really is. It is about universalism of restructuring. Okay. It is not meant to be territorial. Okay. Once you decide where the foreign main proceedings are, your job as a local court and your mindset must be to facilitate and not obstruct. Got it. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, I also see Nishudva, you are there on this call. If you yeah, want to have a concluding point. Yeah, yeah no, I think I've been there right from uh, uh, the go, you know. It was wonderful, Ashok. Thank you so much for joining us. You know, it was very interesting, yeah. giving you a good perspective on cross-border insolvency. I think a lot of people have familiarity with the Indian situation, but when it goes, goes cross-border, you know, it's one of the things is that you read with so many jurisdictions, so many concepts, and so many practical uh, law and practices. They say, you know, uh, issues to be uh, understood and. Um, you give a very good overview, and I think I'm so happy that you found time to join us. And uh, my pleasure, my pleasure. My <laughs> pleasure. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> and we have a large number of people joining us today, and I must thank all the audience. And uh, besides Ashok, of course, you did a wonderful job, and Virapak and uh, Arjun and um, Pavana. I think all of you. Great. Thank you so much. <laughs>